Hi, my name is Laura Tchaikovsky. I'm the Senior Developer Community Manager at Couchbase. And tonight I'm going to talk to you about how you can cultivate a community from evaluation to execution of events, how you can better get involved with your stakeholders, get them to have buy-in on your events and learn your objectives and goals, and how you can both execute these to build out a better community. And that way you actually get to understand where your community are and how you can better engage with them and also understand what they want to hear from you at those events. So hopefully you'll enjoy that from tonight's event. Welcome to the Event Profs Dublin meetup for September. It's really great to have you guys here. This is about building a community, a community for people who work in events. What we want to do is run this on a monthly basis and help to build this community and help to support each other and learn from each other. And tonight, uh, we have two great speakers uh, looking at different aspects of uh, the events industry. So. Uh, Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Laura Tchaikovsky, um, who's going to, from Couchbase, who's going to talk about um, using events to build communities. So please, Laura, take Thank it away. First of all, put your hand up here if your sole job is to do events 24-7. Okay, I apologize for what I'm about to say then. And for those of you who do events part-time, okay, welcome to my life. So, um, as a little bit of history about myself, um, I'm a community manager at Couchbase. As you can hear, I've got an Irish accent, but I actually live over in the UK for the last eight years. So, my job at Couchbase is to develop a community, to engage with those members through meetup meet up groups, through um, community writing programs, build out our experts and champions programs, and provide feedback back into our products. So, we're a database company, so we lead, lead developers to use our technology. If you're using Ryanair, you're using Couchbase Mobile. Um, if you're using LinkedIn, you're using Couchbase. So there's different types of developers out there, mobile developers and servers. So my job is to get in front of that developer audience. And so when I joined the company four years ago, at the time we weren't engaging at that level at trade shows. And I'm gonna give my examples at trade shows here at developer conference and based around the open source community because that's my background. And what I also should say, my background is actually a software tester and who's involved in open source community. So events have kind of like fallen into me. So I've tried to build out different processes in place to actually help me um, get in front of developers that way by using my experience and also the feedback that I've gotten from different developers. So what I say tonight is at least based on like, um, the last four years, I've done over 70 trade shows. Um, that's just me and me alone, plus my day job. So it's quite a lot of um, hands-on experience, I should say. Um, best practices, I'm not too sure I'd call them that, but they're definitely things that I've learned over the past couple of years. And I just want to share that here tonight with you guys. Um, so, <laughs> as I'm sure you're all very well, there's more to just turning up to an event and you know standing on a booth and actually engaging with people because to get to that point, there's like months and months and months of preparation. Um, in my case, um, you know, I start around now for this time next year and I sit down and review about 600 conferences globally because my job is a global community manager. Um, and that can take some amount of time to get buy-in from different stakeholders. So um, from my point of view, um, you know, we, I take time to go out and find the different conferences for us to engage in, um, to actually running it. I, I take care of all the contracts, um, negotiations. So it's a bit of a different kind of job than most people actually would normally do. So rather than many teams doing it, it's just actually me. So uh, I'm going to be giving some of that experience here tonight. So the problem or challenge we face right now is there's so many events out there. On any given day of a week, uh, I get three or four requests. In the last month alone, I've gotten 10 requests of conferences to sponsor for next year. Some of them are even looking for sponsorship for November, and I'm like, well, it's September right now. Why would I sponsor your event in November if two months out you're still are looking for sponsorship? That's probably not an event that I really want to engage with, to be honest. And to be honest, I would say that to any conference venue, I sort my budget out 12 months in advance. So if you're looking for sponsorship for your event that year, chances are you actually haven't done a proper job of organizing your conference. That sounds a bit harsh, but when you're talking to vendors like myself who have to make decisions and buy in from different vendors, from different stakeholders, we need to sit down 12 months in advance and actually look at the big picture from different territories or verticals. So if you're looking for me to sponsor an event, um, two months out or three months out, then chances are it's just not going to happen, to be honest. Uh, and so there's just an awful lot of criteria to kind of like figure that out. And it doesn't make things easy. We don't make things easy at times. So what I looked at doing was actually building out an event strategy. And again, like I said, I hadn't come from an event background. Um, and I had to actually kind of figure things out rather than just contracts arriving on my desk and saying yes to every single thing. It's not possible to sponsor every single event out there. You have a limited budget and you need to make sure that you're aligned with your team's goals and objectives, but also your company's goals and objectives. So you need to sit down and do an awful lot of thorough planning in advance. 
So I should say straight away, you're going to face an awful lot of pushback, and I did myself, because at the end of the day, I make, make a decision to do certain events. They could be events that I have seen or I have benefit from, from attending, from engaging with those developers. Um, but if I talk to a sales rep in a certain territory or a different organization, they may feel that's actually not the kind of event that we should be at. And that's why it's very clear and very uh, important that you make sure that your team's objectives and goals are set first and foremost and then you talk to the stakeholders that you're working with. So in our case, I talk to the different sales reps. That's everything from EMEA to East, West and Central in, in America, all the way to APAC. So I deal with culture and languages and make sure that everybody's on board for them to understand what our team is doing first and foremost. But no matter what you do, you're always going to get pushback. So that's why it's very clear that if I can point to the reasons why we chose an event, their goals and objectives of our team, and show them the benefits for our team to do this, it will benefit not only us, but of the organization. They understand, they may not always agree with it, but they do understand where you're coming from. So it's very, very important um, to be very clear in your documentation of why you chose certain things. Do your homework. There's actually so much work to doing events that I actually didn't fully appreciate it until I started doing one or two, and then two turned into four, and four turned into 20, and 20 turned into 30 a year. 30 events a year is what I actually do, 30 trade shows. That's everything from the likes of an OSCOM, which is about 4,000 developers, up to AWS reInvent, 52,000 developers. Those are the likes of trade shows that I do, um, as well as my day job, which is, like I said, building and talking to developers, running our community meetups, running our community writing program. So I needed to actually have a process in place. So when I talk about research, like I said, right now, I'll start collecting a list, and I have a list from the past four years of work, of about 600 conferences globally. I'll break that down by territory, I'll break that down by vertical. And when I say that, I try and break down the areas that I can engage with those developers. If it's a mobile developer conference, manufacturing, telcos, IoT, um, database, architects. And then I break it down by country. And then I try and break it down. For me, I have a set criteria. I will not sponsor a conference below 1,000 attendees. If it's below that, it's not really worth it at times. As well, if they have 1,000 attendees and four tracks or five tracks, the most you'll ever get to talk to is 40 or 50 people. Spending 20,000 on, on a 40 people or going to a few meetups, you get more for that value. So you have to kind of balance the whole equation out there. So like I said, um, we started off very small at the very beginning. When I first joined, we did four or four developer conferences. Uh, and now I do 30 a year. Um, we're reducing it back to 26, hopefully, because those four conferences can really make or break you. Um, requests do come in everywhere. So again, it's clear to be able to show that I have got criteria for the last four years' worth of data. I have Salesforce campaigns. I have debriefs from the, each of those four years, so I can show that actually, if we sponsored an event for the last four years, and it's been great, we've lots of interaction, we've got lots of engagement from that community, it's probably one that we'll go back and do again. <sighs> Some events make it impossible for me to actually want to buy in. And I do try, like I said, when I'm trying to research as much events, if I go to a website, and many, many conferences out there do this, there's no event date, there's no event location. Those are two criteria that I need to have. And it sounds really simple, but I guarantee if you go looking for the next three or four events that you want to take part in, you will not find that data on there. And that can make or break, because if you're trying to decide in the month of May, you've got four conferences, do you take the fifth conference? Will it clash with those other four conferences? Is it anywhere near where your team can get to? So um, one thing of my pet peeve, which I've noticed over the last 18 months has crept in, is vendors of conferences making me use their portals to sign contracts. Don't ask me to do that, please don't. And the reason I say that is um, legal team will actually shoot me. <laughs> and it, because I can't sign contracts, I have to go through a legal team to review that contract. Um, don't ask me to use DocuSign because again, it needs to go through legal or for finance. And if it's in this lovely portal, I love using portals, I really, really do. Um, but I wanna use them for checklists, I wanna use them for deadlines, uh, I want to be able to find resources in there, but asking me to do certain things that a regular person can't do, I think is kind of a bit unfair. And I notice that more and more events are doing that and not willing to kind of opt out of that situation. So if they do, then unfortunately, that's one of my new criteria, um, which sounds a bit strict, but it is unfortunately creeping in. So this leads me to my um, event conference playbook. So again, when you had nowhere to start from, you had to create something. Um, and for me, it was about, I'm based over in the UK. We have an office in Silicon Valley. We have offices in Paris and in London and Manchester. How do I get buy-in from everybody? And I work remotely. 
many of our developers do, many of people in our organization work remotely. How do I get them to understand that I've made a decision sitting in my house in the UK for us to take part in DevOps UK as opposed to somebody who wants me to take part in DevOps Belgium? How do I get them to understand their criteria? So the conference playbook uh, was something that I created and actually got buy-in from our top stakeholders. So we define who the core team are. So the core team may be your team that you're working with, um, your key stakeholders, maybe they're the team that you manage. Really? Now you want to come up? Um, the extended team, so again, other teams that are going to be involved in using that. Um, the key stakeholders, defining the purpose of the conference playbook is quite key for them to actually understand that this is something that's going to be used to help define things for the next coming 12 months or 18 months. It, obviously, it's a living document, but if it's helped there to make your decision for the financial year ahead, having buy-in, they can actually reference it, makes a lot of things a lot easier. Um, the target audience of this playbook is quite key, so we understand that if a person joins your organization six months down the line, a lot of the decisions have been made. So if they join, they say, hey, you know, there's no events in my region, like, why isn't that happening? You go, hey, let me give you some, let me give you some back history on this. Let me explain to you why decisions are made. And it gives them understanding like, that, that you're, not looking, that you're not, not looking after them. Um, in your conference playbook, there is an event strategy. Um, again, I define the key expected results. What do you actually want from sponsoring an event? So there's so many events out there that you could sponsor. And you really, if you had an unlimited budget, would you ever sponsor every single event out there? Probably not. But what do you want as your expected results? What are the KPIs? Is it to promote a release? Is it to promote a new feature that you've had developed? Um, is it to get community engagement? Maybe it's um, you want a new community champion or expert from the very, you want to dem demo a new feature out there? Like, what do you actually want to get from this event? Once you set out that clear defining um, return of what your investment is, it makes it easier to make that decision for the event that you want to sponsor. So you're taking away a lot of the personal preferences of your choices. So again, me personally, I would go to FOSDEM every year. It's an event that I go to. It's got 13,000 developers. It's an open source event. It's no vendors. It's brilliant. That's an event that I would always choose to go to, but it's not an event that I would probably sponsor because it doesn't make sense from my organization. There are other events out there that I maybe I don't enjoy as much, but it makes logical sense for me to sponsor. So by creating a conference and event strategy playbook, you take away your personal preferences from the equation and you make it more of a business strategic example. So for the pre-event, um, I do involve all the different stakeholders. That it means involving all the different sales reps or the engineers or the developers in that region. So we just sponsored GopherCon. So we involved the reps in the region, but we involved the Go SDK developers in our team. So we say, hey, you know, we're taking part in this event. Would you like to come and take part in it so you can understand about it? It's all about understanding and getting them to buy in so that they understand why you're taking part in this event, why you're not at another event, or why you haven't produced another blog post, so they can understand um, the decisions that are being made. It's all about being clear and transparent and getting buy-in at the start. Um, we try and get them to have an understanding of the events that we choose. Um, we do provide a lot of the information ahead of time. Um, this all lives in your pre-event strategy document. So again, I think it's very clear in every event that we choose, um, we kind of remind ourselves every single time, uh, what is the goal, what is the objective um, for you to take part in an event? So again, for your own organizations, whatever you do, I would say define your own goals and objectives ahead of time. And if for every single contract that you choose or every single event that you're looking to review, ask yourselves, why are you doing it? What is it going to achieve? Um, does it meet your goals and objectives? Because your goals and objectives are going to differ from maybe your other stakeholders, your extended stakeholder team, how do they combine to make sure this is an event that you want to invest in? You have been chosen. You are the chosen one. So um, once you decide on the events that you've certified your conference playbook metrics, and again, this all lives in your, in your living document, um, I do reach out to the vendors. And again, it goes back to if your website has met my criteria, I'll talk to you again. Um, Reach out to the vendors. Um, there are ways for you to take part in. So you ask for them to be sent the prospectus. I noticed that's another new thing that's, that's kind of crept in over the last couple of years. In order to get the prospectus of an event, you have to fill in a form for them to email it to you afterwards. I don't want to be chased down by 400 different people of event prospectuses. I want to be able to just get the prospectus online, download and review at my own time, my own leisure. But again, that's something that seems to have crept in. Maybe it's a more of a North America thing. I don't know what it's like over here, but most of the events that I'm getting recently, I have to fill in a form and provide more details, and that's just 
taking things up a bit longer than it needs to be. So like I said, there's a lot of work and prep for events. Um, and it starts with <coughs> housekeeping and being a little bit OCD for me. This is a tool that I can highly, highly recommend. It's a free tool. Um, it's developed by um, Red Hat engineers who work on OpenShift. Um, it has by far simplified my life and my team's life. So there's me as a community manager and five developer advocates. How do we track the number of events that we take part in? How do I track who's going to be staffing a booth, who's submitted a paper to? This tool is amazing. I would highly recommend everybody to use it. So to give you an example, so here um, is just a snapshot of all the events that I've put assigned against myself and I'm the admin, where these are all the events that we have confirmed and agreed to take part in. So this just gives you a snapshot of what September through December. So I can see, and I, in the example, it creates a lovely little timeline. It creates um, an activity that I know I need to take part in. It has a beautiful, simplistic view of my committed to events, my CFP deadlines, because our team also submits um, talks to conferences. And um, it tracks Europe, North America, and it tracks my committed events. So all of the team that log in, when they see we have a weekly review of the events that we're taking part in our weekly CFP call, we can track what deadlines are coming up. And because, again, if you come across an event, you say, oh, the CFP isn't open. Right, OK, well, that's kind of annoying. If I forget about that in two months' time on the line, you've missed that CFP call. You can put this information into this document. And when you log in a couple of weeks' time, you go, oh, CFP is due. I, it's now open. I can actually submit the paper. So it's a brilliant tool, and it's free. And I would highly recommend people use it. Excuse me. It's a website. Yeah, it's just uh, evman.io, um, and it's 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 uh, developed by the um, the guys who work on OpenShift and Red Hat. It's brilliant. Um, what's really nice is I create a little calendar view, so I, I color code things. Like I said, your OCD for events kind of kicks in. I track um, events that I speak at, meetups, uh, what we call it's OPM, other people's meetups, which is this what this is called as an OPM. Um, speaking at a conference, booth duty at a conference, or a workshop. So then you can create like your views for each month. So if you've got a team of five people, it's great. You can figure who's going where when. So you can see that the month of May is not a really a great month to ask us to do something because uh, April, May, and June are heavy conference seasons for us. So that's going to be less time for us to produce content. So um, when an event is chosen, we create an event logistics strategy document. This lives in a living folder. So at the beginning of the year, when I've chosen, it goes back to the housekeeping page, um, we create a Google folder. We target a 2018. 2018 has now 30 um, subfolders with each of the events. In each of those event folders is this document, event logistics and strategy document, and the name of the event, and all of the contracts, and any uh, information. Because if I miss my plane, if something happened in the team, that anybody in the team knows, they can go to that folder and find all the information. So um, it's a little bit kind of crazy for like tracking it, but it also makes sense that um, with different time zones and culture kicking in, having one central location to find that information has made things a bit easier for us. Um, this just helps with the team because again, I if I'm planning this event, I don't always attend every single event, but that the guys know that it's this event this is where they need to be, this is the event location and the event URL. Um, those, are the those are the main points that they actually want to know about. Everything else is bonus. Um, and this is the bonus document. <laughs> um, what's the objective, the event staff, the show attire? Um, what are they meant to be doing at that booth? So this is the document that basically gets printed out and sent to every single person that's um, agreed to take part in this event, because those are your stakeholders. And that reminds them of the goal and objective they wish to achieve, as well as your objective. So they have this event information, you have the event information, there's no reason for any confusion. And there's no reason what has happened in the past is a sales rep turning up to the wrong venue, which is nightmare, nightmare. So bringing on to the execution of an event, um, which should be the easiest part if you've done all the prep work, it should be. It's not always simple, things do go wrong, and I have had swag not turn up, or my booth turn up. But those are outside of my control. Um, a week before the event, we do have a mandatory event briefing meeting. That means anybody who's agreed to take part in this event, you must be at this meeting. Um, it reminds them of why they're taking part and what we, what we hope to achieve, if there's any demos being run at, what are the collateral at the event, so they know exactly what is on that booth. Because sometimes they rock up at 9 o'clock in the morning, on a Monday morning, they're like, hey, what am I doing? You're like, well, you're not meant to be wearing that clothes for starters. You're not meant to be wearing a suit. You're meant to be wearing a T-shirt. If you'd read the document, it said show attire. So. It refreshes them what they're meant to be doing. 
Um, I'm a bit evil about this. Um, I make sure every event that we do, they have an event briefing that morning. Some of the trade show events that we do have a, have a 7 a.m. kickoff in London, um, which means you've got a 6.30 briefing. I come armed with coffee and, co and, and um, donuts or something just to bribe them because uh, they have to know what they're doing that day. Um, one thing I have noticed is that the amount of scanners that differ across the world <laughs> and you give each rep a, um, a scanner in their hand and they go, hey, how do I scan? You like press this button in this case, two buttons over here. They try and write a note, it isn't saved, you didn't save the button. So talking them through that for half an hour um, has saved um, meltdowns later, at this, later in the evening. So we do make that as a mandatory way of actually making sure, again, because we're all remote, we haven't, maybe some of the guys haven't met one another, it helps to actually bond for half an hour to introduce each other face to face. It just creates a bit of a community within ourselves as well. Um, so we actually know who we're working with as well. So during the event, it's kind of, I said it's, it's kind of like common sense in many ways. Um, I, we're doing AWS reInvent this year. It's a four day event. It's an 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., four days straight. You get very tired. <laughs> So we learned that during those events, you make sure you take the proper like, timetable and schedules and you take your breaks. My sister was mocking me. I said, you do your squats and you stretch your legs. It's kind of important. Um, but again, when you're standing for 12 hours a day, it's, it's kind of key that you're still engaged, you're still active, and you're still having that same enthusiasm you had at 9 o'clock in the morning as you had at 8 o'clock in the evening. Um, one thing I'm quite fussy about is no laptops on the booth. If you're not doing a demo, then there's no reason to have your laptop out because if you have your phone in your hand or your laptop out, and you're sitting behind it, nobody's going to walk past your booth and stand and talk to you. And the amount of guys that actually do not believe me. And I'm like, I've sent photographs and we look, people have walked past you. They haven't stopped to talk to you. Your laptop is out. It's not really inviting. The same way, no food. Because again, if you're eating a sandwich or eating something in your booth, nobody's really going to stop and interrupt you unless they're really, really like in a hurry. Um, so I'll start to wrap up. Like Event outcomes influence future events and event strategy. I kind of repeat this as my mantra. So back in October, Last year, I sit down and I review all the debriefs that we have created um, because that defines my event strategy for the following year. We do post-mortem. We hold no barriers. We, uh, we're quite cut through, like, what happened? What went wrong? How was negotiations with the vendor? Was it smooth? Did they maybe jump through extra hoops? Were they helpful? Um, we take all of that into account. We look at actually how the event went itself. We did it run smoothly. Did it meet our goals and objectives? Um, did it actually get what we hoped to achieve from the event? And more importantly, did we get what we wanted from the event? And is it worth doing again? Which creates this event. And this is our debrief. This is a mandatory document that every developer advocate has to write post-event. It's sent to certain aliases afterwards, and it lives in Salesforce. Um, because if we get any leads from the event, they get uploaded to Salesforce. We create a campaign so that I can actually pull out information from this. But the event debrief is a great way for me to look back 12 months. Because again, if I'm not at the event, I don't know how it went. I can say, how was that event? They're like, oh, it was great. Were you there? No, but I heard it was great. I can pull up the debrief. I can actually read it. It wasn't brilliant, but maybe it's worthwhile going revisiting that again. Um, this is a simple little checklist for us that's actually helped keep us on, on check and on target to make sure that we actually have a simple process to actually make sure if we're doing 30 events, we have the same strategy for all the events afterwards. Uh, and that's helped us kind of create uh, a better understanding so that at the end of a quarter, at the end of a year, um, I can pull a Salesforce, Salesforce report, I can pull a Tableau report, I can pull out the information that we've actually achieved from that event and if we actually met our goals and objectives that way as well. What actually has been great about all these processes in place is actually it's led to a better engagement with our community because we now know the events that actually do work what way we've actually engaged with the community, what makes us actually understand what our community wants us to hear from us at those events. So that if we go to an event and they go, hey, this wasn't what we were expecting, we were hoping for more of a technical demonstration, um, that's been really useful for us. If we've gone to an event and we've actually gotten more community members or we've gotten new people to join our organisation, that's actually benefited us as well. Um, what's been really fascinating is actually people have come back to us again and again at events going, hey, I saw you last year, I downloaded what you told me to do, I still love it, I'm now using it in my in production, in my organization. That's really what we want to achieve. So picking and, and choosing specific conferences for us to engage with has led to a much better knowledge and in-depth uh, um, interactions with those community members, which helps me in my job, to be honest. So 70 trade shows in four years. That's, that's a lot of work. And uh, 
you can see why those processes are in place for my sanity. Um, be strict on criteria and avoid being asked to do one more. And I'm so, so sorry that one year I actually backed down on that and it was the worst event we'd ever done in our lives. But the person said, no, no, we must do this event. I'm so close to the event organizers. It's one we really, really have to do. And it was a flop because it hadn't met any of our criteria. It didn't meet our goals. It didn't meet our objectives. And we had no buy-in from the different stakeholders. Um, deciding ahead of time improves the success um, because, again, if you're trying to plan out, like you saw the month of May, I can't really logistically take on any more events in May because there isn't enough members in our team or help from other organizations to actually make this successful. Um, it's still evolving and I add to my conference playbook each year. So this year, like we'll sit down and figure out what could we have done better this year to execute those events? Um, what could we do differently? What do we need to take back to change? But remember, being prepared is only half the battle. The other half is being execution and even more planning and knowing for the fact that sometimes things just are outside of your control. Thank you. <laughs>